Uh, Mike Green, this is James Mellick at the WSIC Studios. I'm with Dr. Lisa Mosier. Um, I was just calling to let you know that we are going to place you on a brief hold. She'll bring you on the air once the show starts, and um, we'll get going from there. Okay, sounds like a plan. Thank you again for uh, being a part of the show. Thank you. Yes, sir. Sorrowful. <laughs> wow, a real person. Because for the work of Christ he came close to death, not regarding his life, to supply what was lacking in your service toward me. This man, Epaphroditus, had been their ambassador to Paul to take care of him. And he was so eager and so willing to go and it didn't care about the cost, willing to die if serving Christ led to death. Both of these men, actually all three of them, Paul, Timothy, and Epaphroditus, are quite a example for us. Quite an example of how we can be sold out for Jesus to the point that we give and we love and we serve, even if it brings us negative things like getting sick and dying. So let's put this whole section together. When you are really connected with Jesus, your eyes are going to be off of yourself and focused on the needs of others. I want to dig, dig, dig a little deep. I want to dig. Dig, dig a little deep, I wanna dig, 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 dig a little deep, I wanna dig, dig a little deeper. You've been listening to Dig a Little Deeper with Pastor Tim Cove. This airs Monday through Friday from 6.15 till 6.30 here on WSIC. If you have comments about Dig a Little Deeper, we would love to hear from you. Please call 704-500-9000. Dig a Little Deeper is brought to you by the listeners of the broadcast, the Wisdom Hour, and your local Adventist church. We would also like to invite you to listen to the Wisdom Hour on Wednesday from 11 till noon and on Saturday from 1 till 2. Hello, my friend. Pastor Tim Cove here. I'd love it if you would come and worship with us some Saturday morning in the near future. On the second and the fourth Sabbath, you can even stay and we'll feed you lunch. 9.30, Bible study time, 11 o'clock, worship service. Hope to see you soon. Always remember that understanding God's Word helps you to understand what God wants for you in your life. Divine, in love divine, I want to dig a little deeper in the storehouse. Of his love, eternal love. Well, I want to walk a little more like what Jesus would. I want to talk a little more like a Christian should. I want to dig a little deeper in the storehouse. Of his love, of his love. It's teacher time. Welcome to the Teacher Talk Show with Dr. Lisa Moser. This show is about challenges in the classroom, education, and policy. Express your concern. Call into the show at 704-873-1400. It is not necessary to identify any school district or give names. These conversations are informative and sincere. Now for your host, Dr. Lisa Moser. Welcome, welcome. Welcome to Teacher Talk. I'm Lisa Moser sharing with you what teachers talk about. Teachers are superheroes. And I just want to reiterate again and again and again how very important it is that we thank our teachers each and every day for teaching. It's a very important role in our society, in our community. And I don't think that teachers get nearly enough appreciation. So please remember to thank the teachers 
each and every day, especially this year. This year is such a challenging year. Uh, we've got teachers teaching in the virtual environment, teachers teaching uh, in the traditional face-to-face -face environment, and either one is quite demanding. If you're teaching online, you're probably developing content. And if you're teaching in the classroom, in the traditional sense of the classroom, uh, then you're probably doing a lot of cleanup, uh, trying to keep the learning environment safe. Um, it's going to be interesting, interesting to see the data on how we have our student achievement uh, turning out uh, this year as more and more of our students are online learning. And, you know, I've taught online. I've also researched and I've written a paper. Uh, I've written a couple of papers, but I've written a, a research paper that was actually peer-reviewed. Uh, it's online. I'm not going to go through the details and the results here on the show. But if you are interested in uh, the comparison of online and face-to-face -face learning on the research paper that I published, uh, you can do that by just going to Google, put in my name, Lisa Moser, research online, and it should be the first link uh, to come up. And let me just say that because this pandemic has changed so much that we are all practicing a different routine. Teachers are doing things differently. Students are doing things differently. Parents are doing things differently. It's a major adjustment. It really is. I have a, a doctorate in education. I'm not an MD. But I do have a certification in peer support as a specialist. And you've heard me talk on the show about the peer support meetings that we have on Tuesdays at 7 p.m. If you're interested in joining the peer support group, it's all about uh, self-help. Uh, you can go to my website for that as well, lisamoser.com. And last week, I only had one teacher to line on, to, to log on, but I was happy to talk to her because she brought up a very valid point of what she's concerned about. She talked about how some of her students are not logging on. She's a virtual teacher online, teaching her class online. And, you know, when we check off a box as to whether or not a student is present or absent, it's a big deal. Uh, whether or not we're teaching on virtually or we're teaching in the traditional classroom, it's a big deal to document a student's participation, whether or not a student is truant, whether or not a student is absent, whether or not it's a, an excused absence, it's a big deal. And then, of course, if you're online, you're wondering, well, why aren't they online? Why aren't they logging on? Is it because their laptop is not working? Is it because the laptop's not charged and maybe they don't have the electricity on at home? Is it because maybe they don't have internet? Uh, is it because maybe they don't want to be seen on camera? You know, some schools uh, require the student to have their camera on while they're participating in the online platform. Maybe they don't want to see, or that maybe they don't want anyone to see where they are. So these are things that teachers think about. It's not just checking a box off here or not here. And we want to know um, why students are not logging on to their online classes. And so I could really sympathize with this teacher and her concern about some of her, te her, some of her students uh, not logging on and how upsetting that can be. So when we look at uh, some of the concerns that uh, teachers have, I, I want you to keep in mind that we're all trying to do something that is uh, a little bit of a substitute. It's just not our typical year. And... Keeping that in mind, we still are very concerned about uh, equity and learning outcomes. So my guess, and if you have a comment about this, let me tell you uh, one of the things that concerned me uh, a couple of weeks ago, there was a Michigan judge that sentenced a student for not doing their homework, sentenced this student to, de to a juvenile detention facility. I kid you not. It was in a major newspaper, so you probably heard about it. I was very concerned about this. I, I wasn't outraged, but I didn't like it. I didn't like it a lot. And although this student uh, had some issues, there had been a, a stolen phone accusation, uh, a possibly a, a physical uh, attack or, you know, hit. And so the student had some issues, not a perfect student. But the reason that the judge uh, sent the student to uh, this facility, this juvenile facility, was for not doing their homework. 
So when I was speaking to this teacher in our peer support group, just her and I online, uh, that's the first thing I thought about. So it is really something to be thinking about as we do things so very much differently uh, this year. And I've asked a, uh, a guest to phone in. His name is Mike Green. Um, he has a huge platform on social media. He talks a lot about um, equity and uh, learning equity. We know that if you are planning on pulling yourself up by the bootstrap, so to speak, if you're in a low economic situation, how important your education uh, can be. So I've asked him to join uh, me here for Teacher Talk. Mike, are you there? Hello. Hi. Uh, are you there, Mike? Mike Green? Yes, I can hear you. How are you? Oh, I'm, I'm great. Glad that you can hear me okay. Uh, Mike, I, as I said earlier, you've had a huge platform on online media. You've talked a lot about uh, education, the importance of a good education. Uh, before we get into some of the equity issues, uh, let's talk about you. Let's talk about uh, where you're from and where you went to school. Give us a, an overview of your background, please. Okay. Well, I'm a child of the 60s, and I grew up in, uh, in the South, down in Houston. And, and my mother raised five kids by herself after my dad left. And when I um, left high school and went to college, I went to the University of Houston. And I studied communications, but ultimately, I ended up leaving the communi uh, communications field and the University of Houston and joining the Navy as a, an engineer. And I learned engineering and excelled at it. And ultimately, I became a recruiter for the Navy. And I worked in uh, southeast, um, the southeast region of Texas, and I was the first black recruiter to work in that area. And I covered 4,000 square miles, 25 high schools, and two colleges, uh, Texas A&M and Southern um, um, at so Sam Houston So that University. was eastern Texas? It, southeastern Texas. Southeastern Texas, okay. Yeah. And um, so I had an overview that most parents don't have. When their kids go to school, the parents don't see them. But when the kids go home, the teachers don't see them. And I got to see these kids at lunch, after school, at home with their parents, in, in classrooms. I got to see their scores. I got to talk to them. I had an overview of what these kids were going through in 25 different schools. And I could sit down and have conversations with them. Uh, th that was just extraordinary, asking them about their dreams and their aspirations and so on and so forth. And what that did is give me a, um, uh, an understanding of why kids who are the most vulnerable kids, black and brown kids like me, were across the board, whether it be wealthy schools or poor schools, they were behind their peers. And what was happening in their lives gave me an inspiration to begin to write a book about it. So when I left the Navy, I, um, I, I began to wonder how to write this book, and I uh, ultimately asked a, a publisher to let me sweep his floors and clean out his, his trash if he would let me learn. Six months later, he made me his editorial director. I Is that right? Back. Well, that's and, that's exciting. And, um, before we learn more about uh, your book, I'm very interested in that. Uh, you founded an organization called Scale Up. Uh, can you yep. tell us about uh, that? Give us a, a brief overview of that. What is Scale well, Up? Uh, Scale Up is uh, a, cons a national consultancy that specializes in a strategy called inclusive competitiveness. What inclusive competitiveness is, is a economic strategy to improve the productivity of underrepresented populations in the innovation economy. Mm -hmm. Now, it's a mouthful, but basically what it means is that black and brown uh, uh, populations are not producing the kind of outcomes, economic outcomes, that they have the potential to produce. And the reason for that is because there is no existing strategy that invests in ensuring that the potential for black and brown uh, talent is cultivated in every community around the country. Well, and we so do know that when we're talking about um, public school, Mike, that uh, the dropout rate is such that 
Um, we've not seen that improve very much. So we know that that's a problem if students are not graduating. They uh, certainly aren't welcome in the recruiter's office if you don't have a diploma. But not only that, there are students that do gain a, a diploma from high school, even may get some college, and that still does not always equate to the type of technical skills and soft skills that they need uh, to better an economic situation. But I do want to go back to uh, something that you said that is very, very important in that we have an achievement gap and we're not really addressing why it is that we have this uh, achievement gap. Do you have some ideas about uh, some of uh, the strategies that could be uh, addressing the problem? Well, we have to understand, first of all, that all of our schools were established in the 20th century under a segregationist society. Segregationist policies and practices that established our schools on uh, separate planes. So what we're teaching in some schools, we're not teaching in other schools. And at the end of the day, even the best schools that are reaching our most vulnerable population are not preparing and equipping them to actually compete in today's tech-based globally competitive innovation economy. And so when we talk about developing strategies for economic competitiveness, in, in other words, increasing the productivity of our most vulnerable populations, it starts in the school. It absolutely does. But the schools mm -hmm. do not understand what economic ecosystems are, how to, uh, how to prepare and equip the young people to actually engage and, and, and compete in today's uh, um, innovation economy, and it's moving so fast. We're now in, in what we call a fourth industrial revolution that's rapidly accelerating the pace of obsolescence. As soon as we create something, two years later it's obsolete and something else is coming along. We're actually preparing kids on a framework that was designed to teach them to go out and look for jobs. When we should be preparing kids on a framework that is designed to help them and equip them to create job, to create their own income, and to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, under, underscore the entire uh, uh, educational framework with sk entrepreneurial skills. I do believe... Critical thinking, problem yeah, solving. I, I do believe that uh, when we're talking about educating our youth, uh, that we don't really understand or know uh, what their occupation is going to be, because as you said, things are just changing so in this uh, digital age that we currently live in. We don't know what uh, occupations are possible are the possibilities. Um, I do think uh, when we look at some of the other countries, let's take China for an example. Uh, they're very good at turning uh, turning out engineering. And I don't understand why some of our schools haven't tried harder uh, to do more of that when we know that that's where some of the jobs are definitely uh, going to be. But let me go back uh, to this dropout rate because when I look at uh, some of the students that are most vulnerable, uh, we get a lot of different uh, reasons from the students as to why they're dropping out of school. I don't look at the numbers anymore because as a personal, uh, just a personal uh, feeling that I get uh, about dropouts, that it, it's very painful for me to see those numbers and, and them not improving like that. But let me just say very briefly on this note that most of the time when we look at what the overall picture of the dropout rate is, is that we're not trying to address uh, the economic situation in that community uh, for those families and for those students. Would you say that I'm in the area of that where you're going to with that? I'll tell you this. Uh, one of the things I learned very quickly is that the, um, the counselors in many of the schools, and I'm not going to paint a broad brush, brush, but many of the schools that I was in personally, Many of these counselors, if not all of these counselors, were, counselors were dream killers. And that these kids, especially the most vulnerable kids, did not see their aspirations being, uh, uh, or being able to achieve their aspirations through the school because the schools did not give them an understanding of how to apply what they were learning. Mm -hmm. And when they, when they went home into these um, economically starved communities, they were navigating... Uh, uh, family dynamics and community dynamics, and one of the things that they were faced with mm -hmm. is Ho that... Hold on just one second. I do want to get you... Uh, I want to let you have that complete thought, but I don't want to lose my caller. 
I enjoy it when uh, someone has a comment. We're talking to Mike Green, but we have a caller on the line. He may have a comment or she may have a comment. Caller, are you there? I, yes, certainly. Yes, you have something to add to the conversation? Yes. This is uh, Rob Young, and I'm uh, just calling it to extend on a, a topic that was brought up by your guest, um, and of course your your your, your show. I okay. am a senior senior advisor for Crosby Scholars, which is a local um, uh, college preparatory uh, organization. Mm-hmm. And when you speak about equities, this is an organization that helps assist with uh, getting people to. Two and four, uh, two, two year, four year d- uh, degree institutions, regardless of their their background, it, it prepares them before college, it prepares them after co- or, or to, to get into college, mm-hmm. uh, test prep, all things. All and, these things. and when you say it's local, a, tell us again the area. Uh, is it Rob? In the, it, it's a, yes, it's, a, it's an Iredell County uh, base. There. The Crosby Scholars is in Forsyth County, it's in Rowan County locally, mm-hmm. but also in Iredell County. Okay. And it can be access. You can access it on the uh, web by uh, Iredell Crosby Scholar. Mm-hmm. It has a host of information. As long as you're a, an individual in the public schools, you you can join Crosby Scholars. There are there are financial incentives from the standpoint of scholarships. There there are educational incentives from the standpoint of making students college ready or study skill ready. All sorts of things that can close the gap between those who traditionally might have an easier time uh, navigating the academic progress or, or process, and those those who might not have the equipment at home or the the, the background or the the, Rob, the, 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 the I, support. Rob, I really appreciate that uh, information. Now, are you talking about high school students, or is that you know what grade levels are we speaking on? Um, we we help as, as early as the middle school years and and really concentrate uh, uh, on the high school years because those are the, the most critical for purposes of of getting out into the into the, into the workforce and, and getting out into the academic uh, um, well, spectrum. Well, we really appreciate you adding that to the conversation. Now, before I let you get off the phone, and I uh, again I appreciate callers calling in. Uh, tell me, what was your opinion when you saw that a student? Uh, for not doing their homework, uh, was uh, sent and sentenced to a juvenile facility. What's your opinion on that? Well, uh, I, I think that the, the, the reality is in that particular case, and I know what you're, you're referring to, is that there were probably some, some a, a, a probationary situation. Where not the best student, that's true. Yeah, and as a result of failure to follow that, Typically, and in North Carolina, it's the case that, that in, if you're on a probationary sentence, you can be uh, brought back for a probation violation. And if you're uh, if you're violated, that could result in in a higher level of sentencing. And in that particular case, it might have just been the the fact that he he was up at the top of the scale, and that was the next get schedule. The problem, though, is ultimately, I think one that that you, you've made. When the if a student is not in an academic setting, mm-hmm. um, it's hard to imagine that they're going to be prospering academically, and that's usually the best ticket to their success is staying in school. So it's lamentable. I'm sure there's some structural reasons why that ultimately happened. It's but but it's lamentable and. Okay, we're going. We're going to. Well, Rob Young, we're going to agree to to disagree on that one because I think that if you're going to break uh, some sort of probation, it shouldn't be that you didn't do your homework. Um, How do you feel? Last question, and I do want to get back to my guest, Mike uh, Green. Thank you for holding on, uh, Mike. What do you think about the absenteeism problem? Are we going to see students uh, be charged with tardiness because they don't have Internet? Do you have any thoughts on that? I think that it's, it's going to be problematic because there are, there are and, and not necessarily in this county, but in some counties there, there isn't uh, availability mm-hmm. for Internet. And, that's good, and, and Alexander County comes to mind right offhand. Um, I think that there is going to be uh, not in these in these counties. I think there's there's there are more bigger fish to fry uh, than 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 truancy. Thank I, you. And, and working with and with it's a different year, with, right? It's a yeah, different I, year. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for yeah, calling I, I, in. We really appreciate your input. Thank uh, you, my appreciate caller. It. 
Rob Young. Thank you so much for calling in, Rob. Let me go back to my guest. Mike Green, thank you so much for holding on. So we're talking about uh, inequities. We're talking about trying to address an achievement gap. And uh, you were uh, on the uh, path or on the note of talking about how we can address uh, some of these problems. Um, Let's go back to that. What are some of the solutions? Well, I, I think that the schools have to be fundamentally re- redesigned because I don't think that they understand what they're in competition with. Mm-hmm. Um, it, um, but back when I was recruiting, the, the, the competition was uh, Pookie and Ray Ray out in the street. They were making money in the underground economy. And uh, the kids in school could not see their way forward as to what kind of outcomes they were going to achieve and how long that was going to take. And so the, the schools were in competition with Pookie and Ray Ray on the street and a lot of them lost to Pookie and Ray Ray. When you talk about the dropout rate, those kids are not just dropping out. They're dropping out, and they're finding other ways to subsist. And that's usually through the underground economy, which has its own risk uh, 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 and reward. Uh, and, and, I want, with it. and I want to add, too, that a lot of times um, a situation or a family uh, might be in, uh, at a time where uh, they're, they don't have all the support that they need, but by no That's means right. is a dropout a dead-end sentence. I know m- many students uh, that are able to recover, return to school, and excel uh, once they have the type of support and the resources that they need uh, in place. What would you like to see um, happen if we have uh, more a uh, additional funding during this COVID-19 year? What would you like to see happen? Here's what I would like to see. One, I would like to see a, a better definition of racial equity in school. I would like to see that uh, uh, schools have an understanding that they're preparing and equipping kids for a different economy, a 21st century economy that requires STEM education mm-hmm. plus access to opportunity, resources, and ownership Ownership leads to transferable wealth. And what do I mean by ownership? I mean home ownership, land ownership, business ownership, and investments yielding positive returns. If we're not keep putting kids on that track so that not only can they pursue their dream, but they understand how to use their entrepreneurial skills to create incomes, to create businesses, to create jobs, moving towards investing in assets ownership of assets so that they can pass that down to the next generation. You cannot pass yeah. down another job. We are so, so ownership on of those uh, ownership of those assets yeah. is key. We, and I think we are so on the same we're, we are so on, on the same plane when it comes to STEM, uh, Mike, STEM, uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Uh, I have said time and time again uh, on this show and on my podcast that if you are in a uh, low economic and a, a disadvantaged situation, uh, the best way to get out of poverty is to have a STEM or a technical uh, type training and career. Uh, liberal arts, I, I have nothing against you, but there's just only so many jobs available. Uh, we have a couple of minutes, and then uh, we have to wrap things up. Uh, what would you like to leave us with for our teachers that are listening, uh, Mike Green? Well, I really think that um, y- your point about STEM education is key because that is the only access to a 21st century tech-based, globally competitive innovation economy. Mm-hmm. It is the only way you're going to get high wage uh, income in this society. It's the only way you're going to get a path to ownership of assets that you can lead to the next generation. So STEM education is key. Also, yeah, entrepreneurship really is. is key. I like that, too. Well, Mike, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, I appreciate you. Uh, if you're interested in more of what Mike knows about, just find him on social media like I did. I'm Lisa Moser. That's going to do it for Teacher Talk. Thanks to my director, Red, and my family here at WSIC as well as here in Statesville. I'm Lisa Moser. That's Teacher Talk for this week. I'll join you next week. is News Talk 105.9 Lake Norman, 100.7 Greater Statesville, WSIC, where Davidson turns first for breaking news and severe.